Hello? Can you hear me now? Hello? There we go. Hey, good morning. Good to have you here for worship today. I just want to say this at the beginning. This group's great behind me and all those guys back there to put this kind of a day together today to begin. And this is our one desire that we would lift up the name of Jesus here in this place. All right? He's the one who on, on focus here. He's the one. So let's praise him today with our whole heart, okay?
stand with us and sing it. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul. Christ loves us. He's given us hope. We're going to sing about that today. Hope has a name. Did you know that? Hope has a name. His name is Jesus. Let's praise his name today.
today for that. He is our victory. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Every time we sing that song, I think of the best chapter in all of Scripture, Romans 8. And verse 22 says this, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves, who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope, that hope of adoption, that hope of redemption of our bodies, in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? Now if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, because we do not know what we pray for as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with unspoken groanings. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Our hope is in Jesus. We sing in that hope. We pray in that hope. We suffer through in that hope because he is worthy of it all. And what a perfect time to be thinking of that as our men come forward to take up our offerings as we say, God, our hope is in you. Everything that we have is in you. And so this is a time each week where we give our finances, but it's also a time in our service specifically so that we can say, God, we give you our lives because you are worthy and our hope is not in anything that we own, anything that this world says is ours, but our hope is in Christ, who we will see face to face on that day. Let's pray and take up our offering. God, we are here today. Because of the great hope that we have in Jesus. God, I pray that you would speak to us so clearly today to see that hope. God, more than that, we eagerly await the day where our groanings are ended. We're able to see our hope face to face. God, take these offerings, use them in our city, use them in the nations so that more and more people may know this glorious gospel and may live in this glorious hope of Jesus. God, be pleased with our offering, be praised by it. We pray in the great, mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Jesus is known as the Lamb of God. Bible talks about. He is clearly the one who has died for our sin, and uh, he is also the one who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to praise him today as we sing, Behold the Lamb, the victory. As soon as you finish uh, giving of your gifts today, we ask that you stand with us and sing.
There have always been rulers and kings, men of promise who boast of mighty things. History will tell us of all they've done and said, but there is only one king who rose from the And he stands above the rest, his name forever blessed. Jesus, what a mighty name. Every knee will bow to you, and every tongue proclaim. Jesus, what a mighty name. The name above all names, Jesus, what a mighty name. At the end of all the ages, these kings will all bow down. And royalty faces to the ground, and there will be no doubt that Jesus Christ is Lord.
Amen. I'll tell you what, I believe that of, of all the, the men, in maybe in our country right now, I am the most blessed of all. I mean, I got to start in our band-led service at 9 o'clock, and we had a, a, a roaring time praising the Lord in that. And I found out they just got me warmed up for that choir to sing, Thou, O Lord. I mean, I thought that was going to blow me off the front chair right, right there. What a wonderful, wonderful time of worship it has been. And, and on top of it all, I get to preach the word of the Lord twice this morning. Hallelujah. Just couldn't be better. I, you know, if y'all looked a little more like angels, I'd think I died and went to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> We've been following Jesus' steps toward the cross and the resurrection these last number of weeks. And as we have looked at those, they have offered to us much in the way of instruction and application for all of us who desire to obey Jesus' command to take up our cross and to follow him. I mean, remember when Jesus gave sight to the eyes of blind Bartimaeus? We came away with the understanding that as we carry our cross, we need to be mindful of those around us that are sick and those that are hurting. I mean, if Jesus could stop what he was doing in the final week as he headed toward the cross and the resurrection, if he could stop and minister to a man like Bartimaeus, we should be able to stop what we're doing and minister to hurting people too. And the same is equally true when Jesus stopped to minister to the spiritual needs of Zacchaeus. I means Zacchaeus was the biggest sinner in town. But Jesus cared for him. He loved him. He invited Zacchaeus to trust him and to find forgiveness and eternal life through faith in him. And folks, Jesus' compassion for the lost calls us to cast off our fear and to share the gospel with people around us that have not yet found life in his name. Even Jesus' righteous anger when he cleansed the temple. Folks, reminds us worship is important to God. I mean, this is not just a, an exercise that we go through. Worship is important to God. And he tells us that our worship is to begin right here in the deepest part of a person in our spirit. 
And that then we are to exercise our worship in accordance with the truth of God's word. So that we worship in spirit and in truth. And then right in the middle of the week. Of all his busyness of the things that he needs to do. Jesus taught. He taught his disciples about the future. And he said, let me tell you not only what you are going to see in your lifetime, but what generations that follow you. What your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and generations after them, let me tell you. And he laid out to them the future of the entire universe. And he said, I am coming again. And when I come, I want to find you watching I want to find you working. Specifically, he wants to find each of us engaged in his work and the work of the kingdom of God. Not as a way to earn our salvation, but as a way to say thank you. As a way to use the time and the talents and the spiritual gifts that he has given us to use them for him and for his kingdom. Then Jesus stopped for a whole day. He stood still. And in seeing Jesus take time to to stand still, to meet with believing friends, to share a meal, reminds us that while there are many times that we have to carry our cross alone, we don't always have to carry carry it alone. Sometimes we can share it with friends. And in in the fellowship that we have with friends, with the intimacy that we have with close friends, in that we can find energy, we can find renewed motivation, we can find encouragement to perseverance so that we can take one more step in our own journey of carrying our cross. And then Jesus let us see what it looks like for a person to be genuinely overcome with love for the Savior. As we got to watch Mary bring her most precious possession and just literally dump it all on Jesus. And to realize that that's the kind of love that our Savior showed for us and the kind of love that he calls for to come out of us where we are willing to be self-sacrificing and to give anything and everything to show our adoration and our worship to the Lord. I shared with you last week the fact that Jesus taking time to just spend with believing friends, to share a meal with them was a point that personally convicted me because I like to go, go, go. I like to do, do, do. And so for Jesus to be willing to take that time out and spend with believing friends spoke to me and it it convicted me. So this week I made two appointments to have meals with believing friends. (laughs) Now, I tell you that just for this, because I hope it gains me permission to ask this question of you. Of all of our views of the steps of Jesus toward the cross and the resurrection, which of those has God used to prick your conscience? Which of those did God take and stir your heart in in conviction about your own steps as a disciple where he showed you that these are steps that you're not taking or these are steps you're not taking often or these are steps you're not taking well now if you're taking notes there's a place on your notes to answer that question it's not a rhetorical question If you're not taking notes, though, you still should answer the question, answer it in your mind, and answer it in your heart. Look back over these last several, which which one of those did God use to, to say your steps are not fully lined up with the steps of the Savior that week? 
And here's the follow-up question. And what did you do about it? When the Spirit spoke conviction to you, when the Spirit showed you that there were steps in your life Jesus took and are missing, or you're not doing them often, or you're not doing them well, when, when he pointed that out to you, what did you do about it? How did you respond to the conviction of the Spirit? You know, if the answer is nothing, then my prayer is that the Spirit of God would be gracious enough to bring that back to your consciousness even today. That you'd remember what he pointed out, that you'd remember what he urged upon you, and that he would give you an opportunity yet to obey him. You know, from time to time... I'll have somebody say to me, well, you know, Brother Mike, I don't know why, but the Holy Spirit just doesn't move me like he used to. I mean, I can remember, remember the times when the Spirit would, would take the Word of God or, or take uh, words out of a song that was sung in worship or, or take something out of the sermon or take something out of uh, the Life Change Group lesson and, and God would take that Word from His Word and make it so personal in my life and he spoke to me and convicted me. But it's just not quite like that anymore. I, I don't hear him speaking to me with such power or, or where I hear him. Folks, let me explain to you one of the reasons that sometimes we don't hear the Spirit of God speaking boldly and loudly to our lives is because there's been so many times for us that he's spoken to us and we didn't do anything. We heard his voice. But we made no response. We felt conviction. We felt guilty for a few minutes as he made application. We saw the need. But we didn't do anything about it. Or we may have said a quick, God, I'm sorry. But we didn't really repent. No, repenting is not an apology to God. Repentance is turning around. We're going one direction. And when we repent, we turn around the opposite way and we go that direction. Repentance is action. So God spoke, but we just let it slide. So maybe the Holy Spirit is not moving in your life like he once did because you're not doing anything about it when he does speak. Or maybe he is still moving. Maybe he's still convicting. But your lack of obedience has made you insensitive to the Spirit's voice. You've heard him so often speak about something or to speak about several things and you just let it go and you've never done anything about it. That now he can speak again and you remember him reminding you time and time again about this thing, this step that you need to take, this thing you need to do or this thing you need to quit doing as a follower of Christ. But you've heard him urge the change so often and you haven't made it that now you can hear it and not feel anything. I mean, it just, just passes you by like water off a duck's back. Folks, it doesn't matter whether what's happened is the Spirit has quit speaking because you've said no or you've ignored Him so often. Or whether He's still speaking but you're just not paying any attention to Him and you've become insensitive to Him. It doesn't matter which of those things. You don't have to spend time figuring out which it is. The solution is the same. Let me tell you, here's the solution. You need to draw aside. Take some time. I don't mean a, a quick 30-second prayer. I mean you need to draw aside and take some time and fall on your knees before God. And say, God, how dare me that the Spirit of God 
would take his eternal word and make personal application in my life. And actually point out what I need to do. To convict my heart to show me the application I need to make. To show me what, what I'm supposed to do. That God would take the time and interest and caring enough to do that for me. And I've not listened. I've not done it. God, forgive me. Forgive me. And I repent. And as evidence of my repentance, I tell you, God, I'm going to obey. I remember the last thing you told me, God. I may not remember them all, but I remember the last thing you told me. And God, I'm going to get up off my knees and I'm going to start doing it right now. Let me tell you. When we start responding again to the voice of the Spirit and doing what He's already shown us to do, we'll start hearing Him again, fresh and new. The steps that Jesus took toward the cross, steps He took to save us from our sin, were for Jesus steps of obedience. I mean, Jesus said, I only do what the Father shows me to do. And so what Jesus was doing this week were the things that his Father had shown him he was to do. He didn't want to do them all. You remember him in the Garden of Gethsemane? Pleading with the Father? Father, if there's any other way, if there's there's some other steps I could take besides the steps that you've shown me to take in going to this cross, Take this cup from me. But the father said there aren't any. There's no other way. This is the way. And Jesus said, so not my will, but yours be done. And he obeyed what the father told him to do. And so we're looking at these steps. But our purpose is not just to gain more information about what Jesus did during this week that we call Holy Week. It's not even to just try to gain a better understanding of of why Jesus did the things that he did and the significance of those things. Folks, our, our purpose is to see the steps of Jesus so that we can reorder our own steps and so that we can walk more in lockstep With the one that we call Lord. I mean, after all, doesn't Lord mean master? (laughs) Doesn't Lord mean the one that's in control? And when we invited Jesus to become the Lord of our life, weren't we saying to him, Jesus, I want to obey you. It's not just that I sent your thumb on me, pressing me to obey. I want to obey you. I want to do what you show me to do. I want to do what you tell me to do in your word. Now, this morning, we're going to look at the steps that Jesus took on Thursday. So that means that we are going to look intently at the Lord's Supper, which Jesus gave to his disciples on Thursday night. And you may be thinking, Hey, we're not taking the Lord's Supper this morning. <laughs> so why, why are we going to talk about the Lord's Supper? Well, there's two reasons. Because one, one is that we are taking the steps that Jesus took during this week in order. And the next thing Jesus did was to take the Passover and transform it into the Lord's Supper. But there's another reason. And that is that many times when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, and we are going to celebrate the Lord's Supper next Sunday morning. But many times when we do it in the course of a worship service, we don't have time to really dig into the meaning of the Lord's Supper and all that Jesus built into this meal for us to realize and to know and to do. So we're going to take this opportunity today to talk about what Jesus did in giving us the Lord's Supper 
then I hope that next week as we come and we celebrate the Lord's Supper together, that we will be able to do so with greater meaning and, and purpose and intentionality on, on our part. Folks, there's no question that the entire week before Jesus died, his mind was focused intently upon the cross. I mean, when Mary poured out her act of love and worship upon him, Jesus said, she's already anointing my body for burial. You think he wasn't thinking about dying? I mean, his whole week he was focused upon where he was going upon the, the cross. So now on Thursday, his disciples come to him and, and they ask, Lord, where should we prepare the Passover so we can eat it together? This Passover was going to be the last Passover his disciples would eat with Jesus. But as Jesus ate this Passover with them, as he celebrated God's redemption of Israel from slavery to Egypt, Jesus gave the meal a whole new meaning. It became a new meal and the new meaning would all center upon the cross. So let's read Matthew's account of what happened. Would you stand as we read Matthew chapter 26? Beginning in verse 17. Reading your Bible, you can read on the, on the screen. However, but just follow carefully. Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread... The disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood in the new covenant, which is shed for many. For the remission of sins. But I say to you. I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on. Until the day when I drink it new with you. In my father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn. They went out to the Mount of Olives. You may be seated. Folks the celebration of the Passover. Was a strictly kept and sacred ritual for the Jews. There were traditionally many items on the table for the Passover meal, and each one of them had a significance. As Jesus planned the transformation of the celebration from celebrating God's deliverance of Israel from slavery to Egypt to a celebration of deliverance from bondage to sin and death, Jesus had many items from which to choose. Some of the things that were on the Passover table were unleavened bread, four cups of grape juice, not just one cup. And by the way, this juice probably also was unleavened or unfermented, and I'll tell you why I say that in just a minute. A third thing that was always on the table was a bowl of what they called karosheth. Kerosheth was a mixture of mashed dates, apples, pomegranates, and nuts that made kind of a thick, lumpy jam. And, but it was colored kind of like the color of bricks because it was used to remind those that would eat it of the bricks that the Israelites had to make for Pharaoh's building. And then there was a plate of bitter herbs to remind them of the bitterness of their slavery. And there was just a bowl 
of salt water in remembrance of the tears that they shed while they were slaves. But the most important thing on the table was the roasted lamb. Because the lamb reminded them of the lamb slain by each family, the blood of which was smeared on the, on the doorpost and upon the lintel above the door for each household, so that when death came upon, it descended upon the families to take the firstborn of all of those in Egypt, it would pass over their homes and there would be no death. Folks, that's why the meal is called the Passover. Because the blood made death pass over them. So from these elements, Jesus picked two. Just two. He picked the unleavened bread and a single cup of grape juice. So why did he pick the bread? Well, the bread itself signified that God became human. That God became a man. John gives us some detail of Jesus' conversation with his disciples at the supper. In John chapter 6, he reports that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. Now, Jesus is now pointing to himself, folks. He's pointing to himself. He says, this is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. And if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Now this bread was unleavened bread. And the lack of leaven signified that the Son of Man lived a perfect, sinless life. You see, throughout the Old Testament, leaven and fermentation is a symbol for sin and for evil. And so in Hebrews, we read, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are. Yet, without sin. And so when God commanded them to eat unleavened bread for the Passover as they were about to leave Egypt, he said, do it because your deliverance is going to come suddenly and you will not have time to prepare. There will be no time for the bread to rise in your homes with the yeast in it. So use unleavened bread. But God knew, (laughs) oh, God knew that that unleavened bread would become now not just a part of the Passover, but of the Lord's Supper. And it would take on a whole new significance where it would stand for the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and would remind us that he, though tempted in every way we've ever been tempted, was without sin. The breaking of this bread means that the Son of God humbled himself even to the point of the humiliating death on the cross. Philippians says, being found in the appearance as a man, he, Jesus, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now we take the bread and we eat it. Eating the bread means that by grace through faith, we have allowed the living Christ to come into our lives. Do you remember the invitation that Jesus gave that's recorded in Revelation? He said, behold, 
I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Jesus says, I want to enter your life, but I will not barge in. I knock at the door, but if you will open the door to your life, then I will come in. I'll abide with you so that we will fellowship together. I'll dine with you. You'll dine with me. I will live in you. That's what we do when we are saved. When by grace through faith we trust Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Master and our Savior, we are inviting him to come in and to live in us and to reign in us. And so he comes in and he abides as our Lord and as our Savior. So why the cup? Well, the cup means that Jesus, the Lamb of God, shed his blood to pay the penalty for our sins. Now, think with me just a second. Folks, if the bread that represents the body of Christ must be unleavened because that's a symbol of impurity, a symbol of evil. Does it not make sense that the cup would also be without leaven or without fermentation? Because it represents the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. Now, somebody's wanting to raise your hand right now and say, Yeah, yeah, Brother Mike, but... My Bible says they took the wine. Well, the Greek in your New Testament, the word is oinos. Oinos can be translated wine. It does refer to fermented drink. But it also is used to refer to fresh grape juice, unfermented grape juice. It's used for both. It's used for any of the fruit of the vine, fresh or fermented. So just by the use of the word, we can't tell which it was. But I'm telling you that for consistency's sake, it doesn't make any sense that the bread is without fermentation because of our sinless Savior, and then to have fermentation in the, in the cup. You just think about that. But Hebrews said, and according to the law, Almost all things are purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. The cup means the new covenant has come. You know, God promised a new covenant through Jeremiah. Some 800 years before Christ came, God said, I'm sending a new covenant. And in Jeremiah 31, uh, he said, and it's not going to be like the covenant that I made with them in the day that I took them by the hand and I led them out of Egypt. That covenant they broke. It was going to be a new covenant. And this is the covenant I will make with them. I will put their law in, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's the promise of the new covenant. Now Matthew says, Then Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks. He gave it to each of the disciples. He said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood in the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Now, when we drink the cup, we are saying by participating in that, by taking the cup and, and drinking the grape juice, we are saying that I have trusted in Christ as my Lord and Savior. Therefore, by grace through faith, I have entered into the new covenant with God, which Jesus established. By shedding his blood upon the cross. So we have the bread. We have the cup. Why not the lamb? The lamb was the most prominent 
feature on the table for the Passover. But Jesus omits it from the Lord's Supper. Why not the lamb? You know. Because Jesus is the lamb. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus coming down to the Jordan River, saw him and he said, Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And there's only one lamb. There's only one lamb of God. And he was sacrificed one time. You see, each Passover, many lambs were sacrificed. Every family had their own lamb that was sacrificed. And Passover came every year. And so there were new lambs that were sacrificed every year. But folks, the lamb of God only needed to be sacrificed one time. Listen to Paul in Romans. He says of Jesus, he died to sin once for all. And then in the book of Hebrews, Paul writes of Jesus. He's talking about soon after his resurrection, Jesus carrying his own blood into the heaven, into heaven's throne room, into the heavenly holy of holies. And he describes it, he says, not with the blood of goats or calves, but with his own blood. Jesus entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Then again in Hebrews, Paul says, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ Once for all. Now folks, this is a key difference between the practice of the Catholic Mass and the biblical practice of participating in the Lord's Supper. Now folks, I am not a Catholic basher. And if any of you have been or currently are of the Catholic tradition... I have no desire to be your enemy. But it's important for us to recognize when there are major differences between different traditions in belief and in practice that we understand those differences and that we'd be willing to compare them to what does the scripture say. And the Catholic Encyclopedia officially labels the Mass the sacrifice of the Mass. And it explains that the Mass is in reality a true sacrifice that offers the Son up to God as a sacrifice, as an offering every time it is celebrated. Over and over and over again. That is the reason why the Catholic Church insists that the bread and the cup do not merely represent or symbolize the body and blood of Christ. But they say they actually become the body and the blood of Christ so that it is a real sacrifice. Now, folks, Jesus pointedly avoided this error when he established the supper by omitting the lamb that would be slain over and over and over again. Folks, Jesus did not tell us to sacrifice over and over again as a part of the supper. He told us to remember the sacrifice He had already made once for all. You remember that God took Paul off into the desert for a few years for personal instruction in theology. Taking Paul and making him the man that would take the the core truth of what Jesus had had said and what Jesus had had done all centered in the gospel but would make the theological understanding of that available to his church. So he brought Paul to the desert and the Holy Spirit ministered to him and and taught him so that he could write all these precious letters we read in the Word. 
Paul recalls a portion of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Here's what he says. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so next Sunday, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we take the unleavened bread, picturing the sinless body of our Lord. We take of the fresh grape juice, symbolizing the blood that he shed upon the cross. We take it as a testimony that he has entered into our life. That he dwells there. He has made us a part of God's new covenant. And now we do this in remembrance of him. You know folks there are some here today. That need to take this that Jesus embodied in the Lord's Supper. You need to take the reality of what Jesus did. And respond to that in your own life right now by trusting him. There are some of you that have never put your faith personally in Jesus Christ as your Lord. As the master of your life and as your savior. And God's speaking to your heart right now. He's convicting you. He's telling you that's what you need to do. You need to invite him to come in. He's knocking at your door. He's wanting to come in and you need to invite him to come in. And to trust him as Lord and Savior. In a moment when we have our time of invitation. It will be your time to to just step in the aisle and come to me or one of the other pastors that will be here at the front. And say I want to trust Christ. And we'll help you then. Stand with me. Let's pray. Our Father. We thank you for the clarity of the way that Jesus gave us. This simple meal by which we could remember him. And the most essential things that he has done for us. I pray Lord. That as the spirit speaks to us today. That we will be. That we will become. Sensitive. That we will become obedient. So that whatever it is that he has told us in recent days gone by. That we've not done. That we will repent. And we will become not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. I pray that those that are here that have never trusted Christ will come today to invite him into their lives as Lord and Savior. We ask you, Spirit of God, speak to our hearts. Lead us into steps of obedience in Jesus' name. Amen. While Brother Doug leads us in singing song of worship to the Lord if you want to trust Christ you come I'll be here at the front other pastors will be here if you want to come into the fellowship of this church you come or if God's dealing with your heart and you want to come and and begin that repentance you can come just just use the front area as an altar to kneel or to stand and to make that commitment to God that you're going to repent and that you're going to obey while we sing you come as I am.
church as you are heading out this morning i uh, just want to give you one quick announcement we have our choir musical this weekend friday and saturday night uh, you know about it but we want you to invite your friends family and neighbors there are posters and invite cards in the uh, as you leave you'll grab a few of those and invite some friends uh, this friday and saturday night i uh, just want to leave you with this second john tells us this it says second uh, john chapter one verse five and now I ask you, dear believer, not as though I am writing something new to you, but as something that you have heard from the very beginning that you love one another. And this love that we are walking in is his command. This is the commandment just as you have heard from the beginning so that you should walk in it. On my office door, there's a sign every morning when I come to work, I open the door, I see this sign and, and it just simply says, what does love require of me? And it's something that stands at the center of my life and it's at the center of my, my family and my ministry and, and what I think as I move and move about this world and think about what I'm doing, what does love require of me? And so as we move and breathe and live in this world, as we move out, because we understand at the heart of our obedience is a love for God and love for others. So let's love well this week, let's pray. Father, we love you. And God, we know that that love it does not come from us, it comes from you. Lord, at the center of it all, it is you. It is your sacrifice. God, it, it, it calls us to love. It calls us to obedience. And we know that the more we love you, the more that we obey, the more that we obey, the more we love you because we see that your plans are good and perfect, that your will is good and perfect. And so, Father, as we go about our week this, this week, as we go to work, go to school, go to our communities, may we ask ourselves, what does love require of me? And Lord, may it be the centerpiece of our lives as we obey your commands. God, we love you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You're dismissed. Thank you, church.